right, good morning. There we go. So, here we go. We're in session two. And um, we talked a little bit yesterday, uh, not yesterday, just a few minutes ago about our scripture. So that was this week's scripture, Hebrews 5.14. And we talked about how important it is for solid food is for the mature. Okay? And one of the things that always sticks out to me about this verse is that have their powers of discernment. Now, we, we see what discernment is. There's a definition of discernment. Knowing how to distinguish good from evil. All right? And it's not necessarily just good from evil in your life. It's uh, as you sharpen this power of discernment, as you walk, you will be able to know when things are good and when things are evil. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you. But guess what? If you stay on milk, and that's what the context of what we were talking about, if you stay on that milk, you will never get to the solid food, which allows you to practice the spirit of discernment. And so, uh, in the context of what we're talking about in Revelation, uh, in the book of Revelation, why that's important is as we go into the future, as we live these days, we know that the, the days are going to be evil. And if you don't have this practice of discernment, if you haven't practiced your discerning spirit and you don't know good from evil, it's a, a really good chance that you're going to be, you know, you can be taken in. Okay? Uh, just just look at some of the even religious programming that's on there, on, on television. And, and, you know, and I'm not saying these people aren't Christians, but have you seen some of the stuff that's on like TBN and, and some of these things? To me, I mean, it sets my spidey senses going crazy. I'm like, you know, that is the gospel, what they're preaching, but this other part, that seems, that's, that clashes. And that's just because, you know, the powers of discernment have been sharpened. It is, think of your discerning powers as a knife. You know, you can't really do a whole lot with a dull knife. You know, like some of the knives we have in our kitchen. That, you know, you try to cut a tomato and you make tomato juice. <laughs> so, but that's a yeah. That's a different. That's a different yeah. subject. So, let's think back last week. Uh, what is eschatology? Anybody remember what eschatology is? That looking at your notes. I'm not looking at the notes. I write them down. Okay. Is it the study of prophecy? No. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Let's get. Very good. It's the study of last things. Okay, now according to the strict Greek definition, eschatology is the study of last things. It could be the last in a series of something. It doesn't necessarily have to be the end of days. Okay, but in our usage, David is correct. It's the study of Bible prophecy. It's the study of unrevealed things. Okay, un un unseen things. Okay, the things that shall come upon us at the last. Now, what are some reasons to study this? We talked about it last week. Give me some reasons. Be to be prepared. Right. Give me some other reasons. How much of the Bible is Bible prophecy? Huh? A lot of it. 25%. 25% of that Bible that you have is unfulfilled Bible prophecy. Now, as you read it, you may not think that that's unfulfilled. Um, but trust me, a lot of it is unfulfilled Bible prophecy. A lot of it is promises. And a lot of it is uh, prophecy in general that has been fulfilled. Okay, When you read the book of Daniel, a lot of that was fulfilled prophecy. <laughs> and it was fulfilled so accurately that people have to question the authority of the book. They have to say that because of some, the prophecies, and we're actually going to look at Daniel here in a minute, because of the prophecies were so specific about the coming of Christ, they have to say that, well, this book wasn't written in the 6th century B.C. by Daniel. It was written by somebody in the 1st century A.D. because it is so specific. And it certainly couldn't have been written in the 4th or 5th century because, you know, the prophecies of Jesus, but... Guess what? It was written in the 6th century because that's our God. Our God declares the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Our God stands out, like we talked last week, our God stands outside of time. And one way to illustrate that, I, I normally do it with a 
a rope, but we're going to do it this way. If, if this is where we are now, and this is the future, and this is the past. Get the wrong ones. Yeah. yeah. The one's on two Let's try this. There we go. And there's the past, okay? See, we live like this. We can see real good right behind us, but as we go back in time, our vision kind of narrows. Honey, sweep this way just a little bit. If you can't, okay, there you go. Okay, our vision kind of, <laughs> now, we can kind of have a guess what's going on in the future, but we really can't know for sure, okay? We got some good guesses about, anybody got a guess at what you're doing tomorrow? I'm driving to Louisiana tomorrow. I'm taking home with an appointment. Okay, <laughs> we think. God willing. God willing, yeah. Crick doesn't rise, right? Well, Crick probably ain't going to rise, so God willing. But here's how God looks at time. See, we look at it like this. And we can look over our shoulder and we can see, but you know, I can see real clear right here, but the more distant I get, I think that's a building and I think that's some power lines, but then I kind of lose vision. See, here's how God looks at time. So at the very same moment that, that we're speaking here this morning, God is watching us. God is observing the cross. God is observing the creation. God's observing the end of the world. See, and that's a very hard concept to get, that he stands outside of space-time. And that's, a, that's another subject altogether. But it's one thing you have to understand about how accuracy, accurate the, the prophecies of the Bible are. And it's because God is not constricted by time. He's not looking forward into the future and guessing. He's watching it. So, some reason to study Bible prophecy is because it kind of reveals who God is. Okay, it reveals God's ultimate plan for us. It's uh, but the the big one is is what Lance said. The reason to study Bible prophecy, the real reason, is because first of all, the Scripture commands you. Okay, all the more as you see the day approaching, but we also have to study it because it, it builds us up. It gives us hope. So the best way to study. <clears throat> anybody remember some of the best ways to study? Okay, I'm going to go help you here. Okay, to know the original meanings of the Greek and Hebrew. And we're going to actually look at that. Uh, remember what I told you we talked about is no man knows the day or the hour, and that's coming up right up. So, including the grammatical structure. You know, anybody an English teacher in here? I've, I've had some English teachers, you know, in the family, and they can be real annoying. When you you say ain't and other things, ain't ain't a word. Ain't ain't a word. Well, guess what? So, as bad as American English is, Greek is a hundred times worse. They're very specific. You have moods and tenses, and and all of these different uh, voices, and you have all these different things. And when you add them all up, it shows. It just it's so specific and precise. And we're going to see that this morning. So. To the best of our ability, we want to have the those original grammatical structures. And I'm going to show you how to use eSword to find this. Uh, another context. So who was there? And what did what they were hearing in that original language, what did it mean to them? Okay, we can get a really good idea by looking at our Bible. Okay, but there's some things that we need to try to go back to the first century in the context of the time. What were they facing? You know, what did this mean to them? You know... When, uh, when Paul says, you know, I, I urge every, everyone to lift up holy hands, okay? When we lift up holy hands and pray, what is that? I mean, we think of, you know, what we do. That means something totally different to that first century Jew, okay? And don't study the text through the lens of your tradition. This is real important, uh, and we really do have a tendency to get bogged down. So... No man knows the day or the hour. All right? There's the verse that we're going to start with. And there's a reason why we're starting with this, and you will see as we move on to this study. So, let's talk about the lens here. What is our lens or tradition? Traditionally, what is how you've heard this preached, what does this mean to you, this verse? No man knows the day or the hour. Tell me. Nobody knows when Jesus is Nobody knows when Jesus is going to come. Okay, now sometimes people use that as an excuse to not even look. Am I right? Yep. They say, well, no one knows, and since I can't know, 
I'm not even going to pay attention to it. Okay? Is that a good <coughs> estimation of... Don't shake your head no yet, because you're about to shake your head yes. Is that, a, is that a pretty good estimation of where the traditional interpretation of this verse is found? Okay. Oh, well, you know what? Nobody knows the day or the hour, and so that's my get-out-of-jail-free card, so I don't have to go do some research, some study... You know, even though there's all the other scriptures, hmm? pay attention to the news. Yeah, even though there's all the other scriptures that say, "Hey, you know, watch, for you know not what hour what hour your Lord may come." But he didn't say, you know, so go to sleep and, and chill out. He said, "Do what? Watch." Go ahead. Another question: Does that not also mean that when we interpret, okay, no one knows the hour, to me, what I have known? up until now, unless somebody corrects me, is that that's the day that I'm going to go home to meet the Lord. I'm going to die. Um, we can, I mean... You can, you, can, you can go that way, but specifically, remember, let's go back. Okay. Look at the second one. Mm -hmm. Context. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what you, when you want to think about that, you got to look at the context of that scripture. In the context of that scripture, Jesus is talking, the disciples have come to him Okay, we had, we had Luke 21 and we had Matthew 24. And one's called the Great Temple Discourse, one's called the Olivet Discourse, because even though they're very alike, they're not. They're given in two different places. A lot of people don't know that. We'll talk about that uh, in a couple of weeks. The context is, what are the, in, what are the signs of the end of the age and the signs of your coming? And so the context is, Jesus is coming yeah. in the end of the age. Okay, so always remember that context. But we also have to remember that there are personal applications of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Okay, even though it may be specifically speaking about an issue, we don't have to just throw it to that issue. That's the way Scripture, that's why it's so wonderful, because I can take something that was specifically for the Jews 2,000 years ago, I can take the Song of Moses, okay, mm -hmm. and, and I can apply that to my life. That's right. Okay, so even this, you know, we don't know the day or the hour. You know, all, all we know is that it is appointed for man wants to die. You have a divine appointment, and you don't know when it is. Okay? So no one knows. That's your traditional lens. So, but, let's use our best way to study guide. Remember what we said the best way to study is? Best way to study is look at the original language and look at the context. Okay? What did it mean to these people? So, best way to study. Now, does that change possibly the way we look at this verse? Well, it does. So first of all, who's listening to Jesus here? In the context of the scripture, who, who is he speaking to directly? The disciples, and where are they? They're on the Mount of Olives. Okay, it's called the Olivet Discourse. Okay, so he's speaking to the disciples. And what's the context? We just talked about it. What's the context? What are they asking about? When's it happening? When's it coming? When are you coming? Yeah, exactly. What what are the signs that we can look for? You said you're going to come again. We still don't think you're going to die. So it's probably a little confusing for them. Because up until that moment, they, they really didn't fully understand that Jesus was going to die and be raised again. They thought, man, I don't know what they were thinking. So, but what's the theme of the passage? The whole passage, verse uh, chapter 24 and 25. What's that theme? The it's the coming of Christ, right. That is the theme. And the theme also is that these are the beginning of the birth pains. Matthew 24, 8. When he lists all these things, earthquakes in diverse places, and wars and rumors of wars, and all these things that we've heard, the context of that is these are birth pains. All right? Well, the context of it is that prophetic, prophetic picture is like labor pains. Now, how does being pregnant... Now, Liz, okay, I, I think some of you can, you might have a little bit better, uh, you know, even Carrie, when you were pregnant, it, it's different than it is, I mean, did they, were they able to tell you the sex of the child? No, and this is just, you know, 30, 40 years, right? Okay, so how do, how, how you're going through pregnancy now, how does that differ than 2,000 years ago? Because remember, Jesus has said it's like labor pains. So we have to get into the context. Now, when we think of labor pains now, we have our 21st century context of what that means. And a lot of times it's induced labor. 
We know the day of the hour that we're, we are going on January 8th, 2008, and have our baby. Well, 2,000 years ago, was that the case? How was it? Sometimes you didn't even know you were pregnant. Okay, right? You didn't even know you were pregnant. And early on in your pregnancy, you finally got a clue that, I think I'm with child. Unless you're Mary, and an angel visited you and said, hey, you're with child. Okay, well, how can that be? Well, guess what? That's a different story. So, we have the context of now, we're labor pains, we think we're pregnant. Do you know the day or the hour at that point? Do you even know the month? Maybe? Approximately. But if it falls on the end of the month, you don't know. It could be September, it could be October. Okay? It depends. Now, as you move on in your pregnancy, I bet you can start narrowing that down. Okay? And now, when you get that first labor pain, the water hasn't broke yet, you get that first labor pain, can you narrow it down to maybe the day? Maybe. Am I right? Okay, it may be tomorrow. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow. Then your water breaks. And then the labor contractions come harder and harder and harder. Then you're narrowing it down to the hour. And finally, when you start pushing, you're narrowing it to the hour. Unless you're David. Okay? Unless you're David and stubborn. <laughs> Our son David. He did it won't come out. So. 20 hours. 20 how many hours? 22. 22 hours. So. For a, a, a nine pound? Nine six. Nine six, yeah. Hey, he was comfy. So uh, he was stubborn then and he's still stubborn. No offense, son. Um, so that's the context here. That's, that's what Jesus is saying. It's like labor pains. And so if it's like labor pains, we have to think in those terms 2,000 years ago. And just, but just as today, when you're in labor, you can narrow these down. And if Jesus says... The coming of the Son of Man is like labor pains. That means there's going to be a birth. And the closer you get and the closer those things come together and the more intense they are, you know you're coming upon the minute. Okay? But that's, the, that's looking at it contextually. Are there any hints maybe in the original language? I, I, I bet you all know the answer to this because I wouldn't have put it on there if I, if I you know, didn't know. Are there any in, hints in the original language? So what we want to do is we can use our e-sword Okay, and we can also use the, the Word. Remember I said the Word was another Bible program. And if you guys need a link to that, send me an email, and I will give it to you. Uh, if you need a help with uh, e, eSword, give me a call, shoot me an email, I'll help you. But I'm going to have to show you the tools available to you. The great thing about today, guys, is you do not need to be a Hebrew or a biblical scholar to understand the Greek languages. As far as I'm concerned, in seminary, they could just go down to one Greek course, one Hebrew course, basics, because the Greek language is so complex that unless you, that is going to be your life, to read old ancient Greek texts and interpret them, it's just too complex for anybody who's going to be doing preaching or seminary. What I like about you click on the number. Right. That word, it has the Greek, Hebrew, right. and English. And I'm going to show that right now, actually. There you go. So the key here, our, our key passage, what we need to know, and I need to adjust this. I'll cut that out. There we go. What we need to know is no one knows the day or the hour. No one knows. That's very important. In the ESV, and that's the great thing about eSword. In the ESV, it reads this, but concerning that day or hour, no one knows. Now, there's also a tab. When you download all of these, hold on, let me, uh, let me go to eSword. Well, I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, come over here, baby. When you download all these scriptures, okay, remember I said you go to <coughs> tools, I'm sorry, uh, download Bibles. And it's not going to let me, of course, because I don't have an internet connection. Yeah, it's not going to let me. Okay, so we'll get out of that. Um, it'll, it'll look. Come on. 
Well, it's not, going, it's not playing. So anyway, you'll download these things. And the one that I'm going to show you is uh, this one. Let's see. Uh, that's not it. That's it. Okay. That tells you this is a conjunction. Chi, that's the word for and. Okay, this tells you it's a verb, and this t gives you a breakdown. Now, fortunately for you, there are different codes. Uh, I don't know why this is not working right. Bear with me, guys. Okay. Fortunately for us, there are different codes. Uh, and there's a way to look at the codes, and I've got those links okay, on the Internet. Because this will tell you here that that's a verb and it's in the perfect tense. Okay, it's written in that, that, I think that's the aorist, and then that's the voice. Okay, so this tells you here the Greek, that Greek Strong's number. And then basically that's the word. Okay, and I'll show you how to get that. It's real simple once you figure it out, okay. But this is why this is important to know. Okay, first of all. It, it's not the Greek word. Anybody ever heard the word gnosis? Gnosko? Y'all probably heard that. If you're sitting in church long enough, you've heard some preacher say uh, I, that I may know him, that I may epignosis him, which means to have experiential knowledge of him, or gnosis, which is knowledge. Anybody ever heard of Gnostics? Okay, Gnostics, they were perceived to be wanting knowledge because it comes from the Greek word no. Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. Or G-N-O-S-K-O. -O, okay? Gnosko. However, this is why we have to look in the original language. Because, see, that's not the word. That's a different word. That's Ido. And that means to perceive with your senses. So it doesn't really mean to know with my head. It means no one's going to perceive with their senses the day or the hour. That's huge. Okay? That is, that is really huge. Uh, one way to know exactly what the word means is go look at some other verses that have that word. And we can see in Matthew 2.2, 2, the same word, Ido, is used to say we have seen his star in the east. Okay? So that's very important. That changes already the way we think about no. I'm going to be able to figure this out with my head. Okay? Because that's what gnosko is. I'm figuring it out with my brain, okay? Ido is I'm perceiving it, okay? I've got a hinkling. I've got a, uh, I've got a, a warm fuzzy. I, I'm, you know, I'm perceiving this with my other senses, okay? So that's important. Now, quick shout out to the word. This is why I like the word. Okay, this is why this is one thing that Esau does not do that the word does. And if you just type in the word Bible software, you'll find it. And it's real easy to download. It's a little bit more of a bear to get to know. But here's the thing. If you put it into the King James, all of this stuff is stuff I've downloaded, all these different. But here's what I like. I can say King James. Then I can right click on the word of that day or the hour, know it, no man. And now I can go look it up. I can go see, hey, look up that Strong's number. Where else has it been? And boom, there it tells you. Every time that Greek word, the stem of that Greek word is used, there it is. And that, if you have a, a, if you're a little confused about what, what the verse is trying to say with that Greek word, just go look how it's translated in other places. Look at the context, and that'll help you out. The other good thing is uh, you can just look up to know. Anytime the, the English word know, and then it, you can look up where that is. Okay, so that's just a, a quick a quick shout out to the word. I have both of them, and I use them for different things. Okay? I, I use them, they're, they're two tools. I'm not relying on, the eSword is by far, because as Herman said, the great thing about eSword is that treasury of scripture knowledge. And I'm going to mess this up again, but here we go. Um, see, I can take this uh, into any the ASV. I can put it in anything, 
and then I can hold it there. This is the treasury scripture knowledge. But I have this against you because you have left your first love. Now I can go in here and look at anything about leaving love and, and love. And it's, it's just really, really simple. Okay? All right. So, let's get, get into it here. So, there's the word. There is the link. This will be on, I will send this out in PDF notes again like I did last week. And I will have that link. If you just go to that link, and basically you look up that on there, and it's a table you can just click, and it tells you. Okay? It tells you what it is. And then, I can go to this link, which is, there's, there's numerous links out here you can do this with. I can go to this link and say, okay, what does this verb in the perfect tense, because it's in the perfect tense, in the active voice, in the indicative mood, what does that mean? Okay, so let's go backwards. In the indicative mood, it, means it states something as fact. It's a fact. I have on a brown shirt. That's a fact. Okay? The active voice is at the subject. I am the subject, so I speak in an active voice because I'm the subject of the sentence. I have, an, I have a shirt on. Now, here's where it's interesting. The perfect tense. It's not written in the present tense. It's written in what we call the perfect tense. That means that the action is completed at some point in the past with continuing results to the present. What the, why that's important is this. It says nothing about the future. If Jesus wanted to say, no one knows, and meaning I don't know now and you will never know, then it has to be written in the present tense. It cannot be written in the perfect tense. The perfect tense is, I don't know what I'm doing next Thursday. Okay? If I say it in the present tense is, I don't know what I'm doing next Thursday, that means I'm doing nothing next Thursday. Does that kind of make sense? So this is really important here with this verse. So basically, the context is labor pains. And the day of that birth is not known right away. And as time goes on, we narrow it down, and we perceive with it. And it's not something we know as facts, but perceive with our senses. And because of the way it's written, the results mean are only past and right now when he said it. But it has no bearing on the future. So now let's go back to our traditional lens. Our traditional lens was that we don't know, and that when he said it right there in that tense, it meant right now, and it means forever. No one knows, right? No, because it's written in the perfect tense. Okay? We're written in such a way that it says you can't know right now, but that don't mean you don't know then. Okay? I didn't make this up. This is the Greek. That's the reason why it's so important. Okay. So, real quick, we're going to get into Christian es ex ex ah, eschatological views. I'll say that ten times. Okay. The, did y'all know there's different ways to interpret this prophecy? There's, there's a bunch of different ways to interpret prophecy. One of them is called preterism. And what preterism is, is a, fall, a, a, a full or partial fulfillment in the first century. That's preterism. Okay? Preterism says that everything that I'm reading in the book of Revelation, that happened 70 AD. Okay? Historicism is everything that happened in the book of Revelation was fulfilled sometime between 70 A.D. and later. But it's already happened. It's history. Then there's idealism. That means that everything in the book is symbolic. Nothing means anything substantial. Okay? That is a, an idealistic way of looking at it, and that's the way a lot of people look at it. A lot of denominations look at it as symbolic. There is no literal mark of the beast. There is no literal beast. There is no false prophet. There is no rebuilding of the temple. There is no rapture of the church. There is, you know, it's all a big symbolic book. And then there's a futurist view. And that's the side that most of us come down on. And in that futurism, we have amillennial and postmillennial. Now, this all depends on your view here, on where you place the millennial reign of Christ, and where do you place his coming to it. Now, before World War I, most people were amillennial or postmillennial. And what they believed is that we would usher in the kingdom. We would have 
as the church would basically evangelize the whole world, we would make the world all Christians, and then Jesus would come. Well, World War I literally blew that apart because they say, wow, this ain't happening. And that's pretty much when all the odd mills, what we call odd mills, that's when they went by the wayside. Then we have premillennial. This is that the second coming of Christ comes before the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is what we believe. And amongst premillennials, we deal with what we call the rapture. We have pre-trib rapture, mid-trib pre-wrath rapture, and post-trib rapture. Now, we're going to get into that in a few weeks. But most of us fall right there. We're premillennial pre-trib raptures. Okay, we believe that there's a rapture of the church, then there's a seven-year uh, tribulation, three and a half years of it being the great tribulation. Then we get into the millennial reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign, and then we see <coughs> Satan loose for a short spell to deceive the nations again, and then they, when we go on through eternity. So, I said we're going to look at Daniel. There's two verses out of Daniel that are very important, and they actually fit with the Matthew 24, no one knows the day or the hour. And they're verse 4 and verse 9. God says, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, this doesn't, a lot of people will say this means knowledge as in, um, you know, we're getting smarter as a race, as a species of people, okay? As a species, the human species, we're getting smarter. That's not what this means. In context here, we're talking about the knowledge, because Daniel's asking what does these things mean? And in context, we're talking about the knowledge of the end time. Mm -hmm. So God says, shut it up. It's for the time of the end. I will reveal the knowledge at my time. And then he says again, to just reiterate to Daniel, Daniel, go your way. For the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Now, if you will go back, and in, in, once you're a knee sword, if you will go look at some of like a Matthew Henry or, or some of the older uh, commentaries, you will see they are just like, wow, when it comes to prophecy. They're real good on Sermon on the Mount and some of this stuff, but when, they, when they're talking about prophecy, they don't look like they have a clue. Well, there's a reason for that. Because they didn't. Because the Holy Spirit promised that this is sealed up until the time of the end. You can't understand any scripture unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. And you, you must remember that. So go your way. And how that, how that works with, Revel, uh, with uh, Matthew 24 <coughs> is that that knowledge will be unsealed. And so because it's written in that perfect tense, we get this idea that as labor pains increase, God's going to grant us the knowledge that we need. Okay? So let's take a real quick look at Revelation. This is a word picture, by the way. That shows you how everything is used in the scripture of uh, Revelation. What words are more prominent than others? So we see some of the big words are great. The biggest word is God. God is used more time in the book of Revelation than any other word. We see earth and heaven and great and angels and saying and throne and seven. That's very important. So... When you guys get a chance, uh, by the way, in Esword, these are available in Esword, these word pictures. You can go through any book and look at them. So the best way to study Revelation, first of all, it's a worship book. All right? And what is worship? Fellowship with God. It's fellowship with God. And literally, it means to ascribe God his worth. Okay? Ascribe the worth to God. Remember that the book of Revelation is a book of reconciliation. God is reconciling the world, the fallen world, back to himself. Okay? He did it through the cross. But the book of Revelation is exactly how all that's going to come about, that reconciliation. Then it's also a book of comfort. And, as we said last week, expect a blessing. All right? We also see in, in Revelation 22, 7, Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecies of this book. That's important. So we see it at the beginning of Revelation that say, hey, you're going to get blessed, and we see it at the end. It says, hey, you're going to get blessed. So there's 404 verses and 800 allusions to the Old Testament. So one of the reasons, as I said last week, that we find the book of Revelation strange is because we have not done enough Old Testament study. 
Okay, because we as Christians have a tendency to dwell on the New Testament. The Old Testament seems a little cryptic. We don't understand history, and we tend to avoid <coughs> some of the things. And, and when we do read it, it's a little confusing. So we have John as the author. He was uh, on the Lord's Day in 95 A.D. Where was he? Patmos, right. He was exiled, and we know that from Vesuvius. who is an early church historian. He said that John was sent to Patmos by Emperor, the Emperor Domitian back in 95 A.D. and released a year and a half later. Now, this is very important, because remember what I said one of the ways to interpret Scripture was? Was preterist view? That everything was fulfilled by 70 A.D. that was written in the book of Revelation? How is it fulfilled by 70 A.D. if he doesn't write it until 95 A.D.? And that's how, well, how they do that is say that he was exiled back in 70 A.D. That's how they get around that. But problem is we have an early church historian that was a, just a century later who said, no, I, I knew a guy who knew John, and he was gone. In, it was 95 A.D., and this was the guy who did it. So it kind of blows that out of the water. So, the location is the Isle of Patmos, and he, he says, write these things you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And there are the seven churches. They're all clumped together, and this is very important that we're going to talk about next week. So, John is on the Isle of Patmos. Why? Why is he there? Ticked off the emperor. He ticked <laughs> off the emperor, that is correct. <laughs> it is important to know that because here's the thing all those who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted mm -hmm. okay you need to take that memorize this verse and take it as a fact alright so the audience that's the seven churches he said write these letters to the seven churches and there's a blessing reads aloud the prophecy those who hear keep what's written for the time is near now, the one thing I want to talk about real quick is the heptatic structure. What you're going to notice when you read the book of Revelation is the word seven comes up an awful lot. And if the word seven doesn't come up, you're still going to see seven things. It may not say number one, the first seal, the seventh trumpet, but it will, it will list blah, 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 blah. And there's seven of them. It has been estimated that there's several hundred multiples of seven. That's a God thing. Okay? And these are just an example. And you can look at that on the <coughs> So whose revelation is it? The verse, verse, verse 1 says it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who gave, who gave it to him? God. God the Father gave it to him. So here's some descriptions of Christ. Who is, who was, and who is to come. He's a faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's him who loves us, him who has freed our sins. He's made us a king of a priest to his God and Father. Okay? That's very important. And he sits in the midst of the lampstands like one of the Son of Man clothed with a long robe and with golden sash around his chest. What do you think it means in the midst of the lampstands? What is that? Okay, the lampstand is what holds the candle, right? Okay. Now, what this is symbolic of is the lampstands are the churches. What that means is churches are supposed to be light. Okay, that's what he's saying. I sit in the middle of these things that are supposed to hold light. Does a lampstand necessarily hold light? No. It's a function by which light is held if it's lit. If there's a candle there to begin with. So... We see that he is the Son of Man, which means he's the Messiah. We see he has a long robe, which is a symbol of his rank and his role as priest. And we see he has a sash of gold, which means that's his, his kingly rank, his regal rank. And he's the head of the kingdom. Now, like I said, you guys are going to have to look at the YouTube. You're going to have to look at your notes when I send them out. But these are seven descriptions of Christ. We see he has hair that's white like wool, eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze. Voice like the roar of many waters. A right hand he held seven stars. In the mouth he had a two-edged sword. His countenance was like the shining of the sun. These are the scriptures that go with that. 
Okay, we see him described in Daniel 7, 9 as the Ancient of Days. My favorite description of the Lord, by the way, my number one is Ancient of Days. I don't know what it is about that, that phrase. It just it get, it grabs me that he is the Ancient of Days. And there's some other scriptures. Uh, feet like burnished, burnished bronze. They were fined in a furnace. That's a reference to Numbers 21, the bronze serpent okay, that, they, that the Jews had to look at in order to be healed from the fiery serpents that had stung them. All right. So, finally, we're going to look at the three divisions. That which was. That's why it's chapter one. These are the things that, that, that were. The things that are is. Chapters two and three, that's the letters to the churches. And things that are to come. That's chapter four and on. Okay? So, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, in chapters two and three. Because that's what is. That is what is for us. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Okay, this is deity. And I put this in here because I think it's very important. Uh, a lot of cults say that uh, God's, he's not deity. He's not God. Uh, Jesus is not God. Well, here he is. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. That is a reference to Isaiah 41.4 and also Isaiah 44.6 and 48.12, which says, I am the Lord, the first and with the last. I am he. That's a direct reference. So this is, you know, three of those references to the Old Testament we talked about. And then we see Revelation 17 and 18. The words of the first and the last who died and came back to life. Now, I don't know about you, but as far as I know, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe Jehovah God died and came back to life. Well, who is that? Who died and came back to life? Jesus. So this is Jesus saying, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and the Omega. All right. So any questions? I know we, we're going through it quick again. We, like I said, we will slow down a little bit next week. We're going to the letters of the churches. This is where we're really going to put rubber to the road. Okay? Because we're going to look at what these letters to the churches are. All right? So uh, once more. There's another scripture, Revelation 1.8. So not only I want you to think about that one in, in Revelation 2, but think about this one too. And if you have a time where you kind of get down a little bit, think on that one because that's, uh, that's a powerful scripture. So this week's assignment is read Revelation 2. Real simple, read Revelation 2. So for next week, we're going to talk about the fourfold interpretive theory. And you guys will see what that means. There's four ways to actually interpret the letters to the churches, believe it or not. Uh, we're going to talk about the sevenfold structure of the church letters. Every church letter, believe it or not, has a sevenfold structure. And then we're going to look at these letters here. And remember, we're meeting in the kitchen room. I don't even know what to call that. Is that the kitchen room? Uh, dining room. Yeah, dining room. We're meeting in the dining room. And so do we have somebody on the list for breakfast next week? Um, do we have somebody for breakfast? Well, All right, Mark? Okay. All right, real quick, I want to... That's nice. Actually, you know what? We'll show this. I'll show this next week. I did download a copy of the trailer for uh, the War Room, but I will show it next week because uh, we're running out of time. Um but again, if you guys need any help setting up eSword, setting up the Word, let me know. I've, I, I can, I've been dealing with eSword for probably 12 years now, so I've, I know the ins and the outs of it. Uh, but I've also been dealing with the Word for a while, too, and it is kind of confusing. Uh, and I can save you some heartache, but the, the tools are awesome <clears throat> that you can use. All right? All right, so let's, let's just let's close in prayer here. Gracious Father, we're just so thankful that you have uh, devised a book Lord, for our instruction called the Book of Revelation. And Lord, it is uh, daunting and scary sometimes, but Lord, we know that uh, all things are revealed by your Holy Spirit in your time. And so Father, we just give you praise and we give you thanks. Lord, uh, just help us as we go this week uh, to be witnesses for you. Father, to help us uh, carry our light, Father, and may it shine before men. Father, may we not be a lampstand that is void of light, void of even a candle. But, Father, may we uh, put our light out there so that people can see your love and your salvation. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.